You're listening to the Naked Bible Podcast. To support this podcast, go to nakedbiblepodcast.com and click on the support link in the upper right-hand corner. If you're new to the podcast and Dr. Hyder's approach to the Bible, click on New Start Here at nakedbiblepodcast.com. Welcome to the Naked Bible Podcast, episode 178, Why the World Didn't End on September 23rd. I'm the layman, Trey Strickland, and he's a scholar, Dr. Michael Heiser. Hey, Mike. It's almost over. It's the end. <laughs> this is the end. Almost. Almost. Finally yeah. I, yeah. And, I, and you're probably hoping that because your, uh, your fantasy team took a dive last week. Yes, Mike. People are getting so tired of talking. You want the pain to end. Of us talking about fantasy that I'm no, gonna, no, we don't need you to talk want about the, it this week. You're now in fourth place. How'd we that happen? Don't need to talk about it. People are tired of it. Who, like. Who's and who, who's up? Who's who's in, in first place now? That is I. Uh, that is the old. pugnacious pugs. Oh, my goodness, they are ruling the league. Well, you have taken over so I, the reign. Yeah, you know, I, I know why you want it to end, but it ain't gonna. It's oh. not gonna end. <laughs> Oh, your your misery is going to continue. Oh, we shall see, my friend. We shall see. <laughs> long way to go. Yeah, long way to go. Yeah. But uh, no, the world is not going to end on September 23rd. And we are so confident of that that we are doing the show. We're doing this episode before that time gets there. So we're not going to be like the, uh, you know, I'll just go ahead and say it, the false teachers that are putting dates out there, and then after the fact, they've got to improvise. We don't need to improvise here. Okay? The world is not going to end on September 23rd. The Lord's not going to return on September 23rd. And I will also add that the tribulation period is not going to begin on September 23rd. See, that's the newest one, uh, where we can say stuff like that, and then nobody can figure out that we're wrong until seven years later. So that, that that's sort of clever. Uh, I might prefer a word like devious uh, to that uh, with all of the connotations that go there with. But uh, yeah, we need to talk about this. It, it, it's, you know, coming up a lot in, in pop culture. Uh, I've, I've mentioned it before and in, you know, both on the podcast, the live stream. And if you don't know, we have started a live stream, just sort of a chit chat thing. We try to do it Friday nights, my son and I. Uh, so look, follow me on Twitter. Or on uh, Facebook, you know, for for those announcements when that is ready to go. But usually 7 p.m. Pacific. But we've talked about it uh, on there as well. But we wanted to dedicate an episode to it because you ought to have some place that you can sort of go for a brief survey of why this is nonsense. And there's really two sort of category reasons. Uh, You know, since this is the Naked Bible podcast, we're going to be dealing with the biblical reasons. But this is getting linked online, not only with the astronomy stuff in Revelation 12, but it's also getting linked to Wormwood and getting linked to Planet X, which is Nibiru. Uh, so a lot of this, you know, the ancient astronaut mythology, again, getting Christianized, getting baptized to make it sound biblical. You, you're getting all of these things together. So the, the other sort of category, you know, the, the, the category of analysis here would be astronomy. And we're not going to do that because we're not astronomers, but I happen to know an astronomer who blogs about this regularly. Actually, Stuart, this is Stuart uh, Robbins uh, on the uh, Pseudo Astronomy podcast. Uh, Stuart's PhD is actually in in geology, specifically Martian geology, but that requires a lot of astronomy background naturally because it's Mars. Uh, Stuart has done a whole series on Planet X myths. You're looking at them from the perspective of mostly science. I say mostly because I've actually been a guest on his podcast twice, and we've talked about uh, things like ancient astronaut theory with Zechariah Sitchin, who is really sort of the you know, the point of origin, at least for the Nibiru stuff, uh, which again, gloms on to with Planet X and whatnot. So I would say, you know, we're going to put this link on the episode uh, page, you know, for this episode, a link to Stuart's archive, or it, it, what where it'll go is it'll go to my page, a page of my blog, and then there'll be links there to individual episodes on Stuart's archive, where he covers the scientific reasons why Planet X, the return of Planet X and Nibiru stuff, is just nonsense. So you'll get that if you're interested. Uh, after the fact, hope, hopefully, again, some of the people promoting this idea and baptizing it, uh, you know, making the sign of the cross over it, 
uh, we'll also go up and listen and, and read as well. Stuart has has links on his his episode pages and just repent of the nonsense and, and move on from there. But for our purposes here, we're going to talk about the biblical reasons why. Again, this is just it's just silliness, and you know. It, I, I say silliness. It's easy to laugh at. It's easy to poke fun at. But it, just this again, past week we, we see the Huffington Post. Uh, they, they, I don't know how much effort it it took them, how much time they put into finding the the, the dumbest articulation of this idea, but they managed to. Uh, someone named David Mead, you know, who talks about Elohim showing up thirty three times in the Bible. Like, does he know what a concordance is? I mean, it's it's, it's a few thousand, David. You're only off by a few thousand. So, you know, here you have the Huffington Post pick this idea up, and they have a, a very, very wide circulation. And so once again, we get Christian silliness that makes it easy for non-Christians to consider the Bible and the gospel ridiculous. So it's not just silly. You know, it, it's actually serious. And again, they, they look for, for the, the ones that are the most absurd, the most absurd examples. You say, well, not everybody is, is 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 that dumb, Mike. There are some like really smart people do you know saying this too. Yeah, well, they're wrong as well. They might be wrong for different reasons, but they're going to get lumped in to the really, really, really dumb articulations of Bible prophecy, what the Bible says, biblical theology, and it really makes it hard for those of us who are trying to do serious work, you know, and and have it matter for the pop culture, again, the wider church. If you're familiar with my Christian Middle Earth analogy, the, 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 the bottom realm, the one that's the biggest, it really makes it hard to sort of combat all that, you know, with, with good content. And, and even worse, when scholars, again, see this kind of stuff, that they, they see what, what really happens online and, and, and the absurdity and the nonsense, and what Christians who you know, profess to want to be interested in Bible study are really saying and thinking about and buying into. It just discourages them from getting involved. They don't want their content used in, in such terrible ways. They don't want to be associated in any way, even if they're trying to combat it with with nonsense and frankly, false teaching. So it it's just not a good thing across the board. But I wanted to have at least an episode where we do a survey. This is not going to be terribly deep because frankly, the reasons why this is just absurd should be pretty evident, uh, in some cases self-evident. But I'm going to just go through a few reasons. I have five of them. Uh, again, why the world you know, did not end, you know, why Jesus didn't return on September 23rd, and why those who claim these things are false teachers at best, or you know, they, they might even be doing it. They might even know better and still be doing it. You know, they're, they're doing things for their ego, for an audience, for money, you know, whatnot. But at, at best, they're, they're just, they're, they're inept in terms of their approach to Scripture and what they're doing with Scripture. Now, in either case, they shouldn't be doing what they're doing, and you shouldn't be following them. You shouldn't be giving them any attention. They can be safely ignored. And if you're listening to this podcast, chances are you're already doing that. Chances are really good you're already doing that. But you have friends, you have people in your family. And those are the people you can reach to, to try to get them, you know, try to take their interest in the Bible and direct it to better content. So let's go through uh, five, you know, again, just, you know, statements, five, you know, topical kind of statements and work our way through the, the list of five for why, again, the world didn't end on September 23rd. Well, the first one is that Revelation 12 is about a past event, not a future event. In other words, Revelation 12 predicts nothing. It's about a past event, not a future event. Now, this, the, the people who are peddling the September 23rd thing are tying this in to the fact that the astronomical items mentioned in Revelation 12, okay, you have the, the virgin with the 12 stars, you know, the woman with the 12 stars around her head, you know, constellation Virgo, the sun in her midst, moon at her feet. Uh, that sort of thing. You, you get things that aren't mentioned in Revelation 12 that are, are factoring into this. But the, the things that I and others have, have talked about in hindsight, again, if we take Revelation 12 as astronomical signage, and in association with the Star of Bethlehem, the Star of Bethlehem is actually part of this, especially if, as most astronomers would agree, the Star of Bethlehem was Jupiter in its retrograde motion. Again, if you plot out what Revelation 12 is describing, if you take it as 
John's actually looking up at the sky or he knows uh, the position, you know, he, he knows enough esoteric astronomy, that sort of thing, or, or he's, you know, he's heard the tradition or whatever um, by those who are into it. You know, we don't necessarily know how, how John got the material, but it, it's there. So if you take it you know, seriously in that way, you get a whole set of astronomical signs. And then there are things happening in the sky in conjunction with what's actually mentioned that matter for the birth narrative in Matthew 2, namely Jupiter and its retrograde motion. I'm not going to go into all the details of that. You could find a, a little bit of a little discussion of mine online in a number of places on YouTube and whatever. But you know it, that, that's legit. It's hindsight, though. And it's also not a fulfillment of any biblical prophecy in the Old Testament. It's just something that we can note after the fact that takes on significance when it produces a date, uh, September 11th, 3 BC. And again, for those who, who might just be listening to this for the first time, and you think, oh, that can't be because Herod died in 4 BC. Oh, contraire. Uh, you're, you, that is the dominant opinion in New Testament scholarship. It's also one of the most unexamined things in New Testament scholarship. There are a number of scholars who have shown that the 4 BC for the death of Herod does not work. And not only doesn't it work, it interferes with other things in biblical chronology. So you could, you could go to my, my website, drmsh.com, put in September 11th, you know, 3 BC or the Star of Bethlehem or something like that. You're going to find my post where I list, you know, some articles that, that you can get. You can actually get the articles, which are, one of them is, is, is at least pretty hard to find, the one by uh, Ormond Edwards on Herodian coins and how that affects uh, chronology, this, the, specifically this point of chronology. You can get that by subscribing to my newsletter. Uh, and the other one you can get as well. And I, I need to add a third one. I mean, there, th this is not, this is far, far from being a, an, an, an axiomatic, unassailable point in New Testament scholarship. It is not that at all. It's just nobody bothers. Nobody, nobody cares about the chronology. It's, it's been repeated so often that Herod died in 4 BC, nobody looks. Well, there are people who have looked, and there are some serious problems with it. So if you take the September 11, 3 BC date, that happens to be Tishri 1. Tishri 1 factors into all sorts of uh, Jewish traditions. Uh, there, there's other material that I, that I discuss in my lectures, you know, the work of uh, you know, Ellen Robbins at Johns Hopkins, how the, uh, the, the flood events, Noah, the Watchers, all this kind of stuff factored into a Tishri 1 date and the chronology. All these things are mixed. They're all part of a matrix. And I discuss these things in my book, uh, Reversing Hermon. So if you want that, you know, you, you can go look it up. You can go get it. But for our purposes here, if you look at what's going on in Revelation 12, you treat it that way. In hindsight, there is no Old Testament prophecy that spells any of this out. It's just something you see in hindsight that marries in real interesting ways with Jewish tradition and, and their thoughts about Messiah. Okay then the assumption has become for some, well, if, if it had this relationship to the first coming, then surely, surely it tells us something about the second coming. Well, it doesn't. Because if you read Revelation 12, it doesn't predict anything. It's hindsight, not foresight. And people say, well, it's in the book of Revelation, Mike. And the re revelation's about the future. Can't be about the past if it's in the book of Revelation. Again, I got news for you. The book of Revelation refers to past events. There's no law that says it can't. And in this case, it clearly does. And I'm going to read the passage. And again, this is so self-evident. I, I can't even imagine why this is, this is an issue. But again, we're going to talk in this episode about why it is. And, and you're going to, throughout the episode, you should be saying to yourself, good grief, that's bad interpretation. And it is. It is. But that doesn't stop people from doing it. So here's Revelation 12, 1 through 6. Again, just to get it fixed in somebody's head that, that might be new to this information. A great sign appeared in heaven, a woman clothed with a sun with the moon under her feet, and on her head a crown of 12 stars. She was pregnant and was crying out in birth pains and the agony of giving birth. And another sign appeared in heaven. Behold, a great red dragon with seven heads and ten horns, and on his head seven diadems. His tail swept down a third of the stars of heaven and cast them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman who was about to give birth so that when she bore her child, he might devour it. Verse 5, she gave birth to a male child, one who is to rule all the nations with a rod of iron. But her child was caught up to God and to his throne. And the woman fled into the wilderness where she has a place prepared by God in which she is to be nourished for 1260 days. That's Revelation 12, 1 through 6. 
Now, it's crystal clear that this is the birth of the Messiah. She gave birth to a male child, one who is to rule all the nations with a rod of iron. That is, that is a quotation right out of Psalms. It's a messianic psalm. The you know ruling the nations with the rod of iron. Again, this is very familiar. You know, if this was you know Christmas time, we we would you know sort of just be able to pick that out because you hear it in songs all the time. But this is clearly, clearly a past event because we know Jesus was born. It has nothing predictive about it. It is a past event. Revelation twelve is about the past, not the future. And even the rest of verse five, her child was caught up to God and to his throne. It's a reference to the resurrection and, more specifically, the ascension, where Christ ascended to the right hand of God, the throne of power, the place of power. So verse 5 encapsulates sort of the mission of the Messiah. He's he's born, born as a man. He's going to, you know, he he is the Messiah, so his destiny is to rule the nations. You know, he, he, he rises from the dead and he ascends to the Father and he takes, he sits down, as Scripture says, you know, half a dozen times. Just look it up. Look up the right hand of God in the New Testament. He sits down, you know, in, in the place of rulership, you know, inaugurating the kingly rule, inaugurating the kingdom. Now, the kingdom isn't, hasn't reached its, you know, full consummation yet. We all know that. But this is what the New Testament describes. Jesus rose from the dead. He ascended. He sat down at the right hand of God. This is clearly, clearly Jesus. And by the way, if Revelation 12 is predicting something in the future— then it would be contradicting the stuff that's already said in the New Testament because because Christ has already seated. He's already seated at the right hand of God. So it's not future. It's past. Anyone, I would think, that has a modicum of New Testament knowledge should be able to read this and understand it clearly. But in this day and age, I guess that's asking a lot. You say, well, what about verse six? You know, the woman fled into the wilderness. You know, who's the woman? Mary, Mary didn't, you know, no, it's not Mary. And of course, Mary didn't flee into the wilderness. The woman is Israel. Israel births the Messiah. Israel is the, you know, the, the, the bride of God in the, in the Old Testament. Israel is, is the one who would produce the messianic child. He is a descendant of Abraham. Okay, again, the, the imagery is, is crystal clear if you know a little bit of your Old Testament. So Israel, after Christ is risen and ascended, gets persecuted, flees into the wilderness. Again, this is, this is a, a, a picture of, of the persecution of, of the Jews, which, of course, we know from the book of Acts happened. Okay, there, there is a Jewish persecution and an early Christian persecution in the Jerusalem church. So she flees there. You know, she, she gets away under persecution. Of course, the dragon, if we, if we keep reading in the book of Revelation, um, you know, let, let's just go beyond verse 6. So after the woman flees into the wilderness, we'll get back to the 1260 days for a moment here, but after the woman flees, now war arose in heaven, Michael and his angels fighting against the dragon. And the dragon and his angels fought back, but he was defeated. There was no longer any place for them in heaven. And the great dragon was thrown down, that ancient serpent who is called the devil and Satan, the deceiver of the whole world. He was thrown down to earth and his angels were thrown down with him. Okay, this happens after or I would, I would say even, even more pointedly, in conjunction with the inauguration of the kingdom. So when Jesus rises from the dead and has victory over the powers of darkness, sits down at the right hand of God, that's basically the beginning of the end for the dragon, okay, and, and those who are with him. And that's what Revelation 12, 7 and onward are, are describing. This is not describing a primeval rebellion of a third of the angels before the creation of humankind. And, you know, in between Genesis 1, 1 and 2, the gap theory, there is nothing of the sort in this passage to support any of that. And by the way, this is the only place in the Bible. It's the last book of the Bible, by the way. This is the only place in the Bible where a third of the angels are mentioned. The idea of a primeval rebellion of Satan and the angels before creation, or in between Genesis 1, 1 and 2, is a myth. It has no scriptural basis at all. Again, you can, you can prove that, establish it by using a concordance. It ain't hard. So the dragon gets thrown down, and John says in verse 10, I heard a loud voice in heaven saying, Now the salvation and power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Christ have come. So verse 10 validates the explanation I'm giving you. Do it. Does anybody read on through verse 10? Okay. The kingdom of our God, the authority of his Christ have come. For the accuser of our brothers has been thrown down, who accuses them day and night before our God. And they have conquered him by the blood of the Lamb, by the word of their testimony. 
for they love not their lives even unto death. Therefore rejoice, O heavens, and you who dwell in them. But woe to you, O earth and sea, for the devil has come down to you in great wrath, because he knows that his time is short. And when the dragon saw that he had been thrown down to the earth, he pursued the woman who had given birth to the male child. But the woman was given the, the two wings of the great eagle so that she might fly from the serpent into the wilderness to the place where she is to be nourished for a time and times and half a time. What's happening here is from verses 7 on, and I'm right now I'm at the end of verse 14, you have the fleeing of the woman, okay, the flight of the woman under persecution, which was verse 6. You have it repeated with more detail in verses 7 through 14. It's the same episode. It, they're just covering. It's like the, the verse six is sort of you know a, a, an earthly reference because the birth happens on earth, and you know the, then Israel has to flee under persecution. Seven through fourteen is, is sort of the perspective from heaven. There's a war in heaven, in conjunction with you know the 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 events you know of of the Messiah because his coming and his resurrection, his ascension, bring forth the kingdom. Uh, you have something alluded to here in Luke. You know, I saw Jesus says, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. Again, I've, and I've said in the past that, that this is in conjunction, because it is, just read the Gospels, this is in conjunction with the, the beginning of his preaching about the kingdom of God. So what, what Jesus is saying in Luke 10 is, is the kingdom of God is in concert with, commensurate with, the defeat of Satan. Satan no longer can accuse believers. He no longer has a claim on their soul. As it says here in Revelation 12, the accuser doesn't have a case anymore. The accuser of our brothers has been thrown down. Okay? He has no authority anymore. So what Jesus comments on when he begins preaching about the kingdom is proleptic. It, it, it foreshadows what's going to happen. When does it happen? Here's the key point. When does all this happen? When Christ ascends and takes his seat at the right hand of God. That is, throughout the New Testament, when the kingdom begins— it's not when the kingdom reaches its full form. It's when the kingdom begins. The kingdom is here. If, he's not, if it's not here, then Christ is ruling over nothing or he isn't ruling at all. And the New Testament has him ruling in many places. So you either accept the language of the New Testament or you don't, or you make something up in its place. And that's pretty much, again, what, what some of these people are doing. So the, the, Israel gets persecuted. And it, it actually expands, if we, if we keep reading here, the serpent, verse 15, poured water like a river out of his mouth after the woman to sweep her away with a flood. Again, it, it's, it, it, it's imagery. It's, it, it's imagery about trying to kill the woman, trying to devour the woman, trying to you know, drown the woman, whatever. But the earth came to the help of the woman, and the earth opened its mouth, swallowed the river that the dragon had poured forth from his mouth. Then the dragon became furious with the woman and went off to make war on the rest of her offspring. Interesting line. Who are the rest of her offspring? Who are the rest of Israel's offspring? On those who keep the commandments of God, and hold to the testimony of Jesus. It's also a reference to the church. The church begins with Jewish converts. Again, this is New Testament history 101. Revelation 12 is chronicling stuff that had happened and stuff that was happening in their day. And you say, well, what about the 1260 days? Well, Surprise, surprise, in the, uh, I have a quote here from, from uh, Owen, who, David Owen, A-U-N-E, in his Revelation commentary, he, he quotes you know, several sources for this. I mean, but again, you can just go look, up, look it up in the history books and do the math. He says, in the present context, it is relevant that almost exactly three and one half years elapsed between the beginning of the first Jewish revolt, A.D. 66, and the siege of Jerusalem, which was you know, 70 A.D., so there you got your 1260 days, the Jews under persecution, and they, it, it lasts for three and a half years and they get destroyed. You say, well, how can that be an escape then? Well, didn't, didn't, didn't you, weren't you paying attention when we read through Revelation 12 here? I'll, I'll read the line again. It says here in verse 11, they have conquered him. Okay, the, 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 the believers, our brethren in verse 10, have conquered him, the dragon, by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony. For they love not their lives, even unto death. The escape of the people of God is not earthly oriented. Okay, it is ultimately heavenly. They escape because the accuser of the brethren has been cast down. They have eternal life. Okay, that's their escape. So Revelation 12 doesn't say that nobody died. Lots of people died. And that's what played out in history. This is a historical reckoning. Now, 
I would add, again, that you're going to have people in the audience say, yeah, 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 this is preterism, yay, hooray, hoopla, okay? This actually doesn't say a thing about preterism in principle because Revelation 12, again, it doesn't predict anything. So it, it doesn't really comment on the rest of the preterist system. You can still have Revelation 12 look back at an event. It looks back on the Messiah's birth, after all. You can have Revelation 12 looking back in time, but that doesn't mean that it legitimizes a system that says everything in Revelation is back in time. That would be overreading Revelation 12 in a different way than the September 23rd futurist people overread it. Okay? We have a persecution following the resurrection. By the time Revelation gets written, really either way, either before 70 or in the 90s, and I take the, the 90s view, but either way, that's history. That's past. It's either, it's either past or like it's happening right then. I mean, it, it's not about the future. And so to use one passage in Revelation and say that's referencing a past or present event, and so therefore we should read everything in Revelation that way. Again, you're guilty of overreading a passage and imposing it on the entire book in the same way or different, in a different way than those who overread the futurist position. So be careful. Okay, we, have, we, we need to have consistent hermeneutics here and making the context of one passage be the context of everything else is not really good method to be brief about it. Now, wings of eagles, let's just comment on a few other things here. Wings of eagles, oh, that must be in helicopters. You know, uh, but that's like an airlift. That, that's the airlift out of, out of Ethiopia when the, you know, like, because the, the people are, Jews are coming back to Israel and now we've got an airlift and we get the falashas out of Ethiopia and we bring them to the land. And, <sighs> okay. No, I'm sorry it's not helicopters. It's not an airlift. It's Old Testament. Okay, Wings of Eagles, Exodus 19.4. It's a reference back to the, to the Exodus from Egypt. Remember where Israel was delivered from Egypt? Okay, so they're using a deliverance image to describe the deliverance of Israel here, the woman who's fleeing. Exodus 19.4 says, You yourselves have seen what I did to the Egyptians, how I bore you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. Well, maybe God used helicopters back there in ancient Egypt. Okay, please, please. You get the same image in Deuteronomy 32.11. You know, God, you know, sort of being cast as, as, an, as an eagle that protects its young, like an eagle that stirs up its nest, that flutters over its young, spreading out its wings, catching them, bearing them up on its pinions. The Lord alone guided him. And speaking of the nation, you know, no foreign God was with him. You know, and the familiar Isaiah 40, 31, this is Isaiah 40, talking about the deliverance, you know, from the exile in the Old Testament context. They who wait for the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. Again, it's about deliverance. It's about divine deliverance. It's not about helicopters. Now, Revelation 12, 11, again, makes clear that this isn't like nobody dies. This ref the, the whole passage refers to, really, really pivots on the birth of the Messiah, past event, the resurrection and ascension of the Messiah, past event, the persecution of the Jews at the time, you know, shortly after the, the resurrection and the ascension and the persecution of the early church, past events. But the kingdom, again, in verses 7 through 14 or so, or, you know, the, the kingdom transcends earth. Now, when it reaches its final consummation, it will return to earth in a global, new, a, a new global Eden. If you've read Unseen Realm, I spent a lot of time on that. So the kingdom of God Okay, that exists now in, 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 a, in a spiritual sense, will return to earth. Okay, it'll, it'll do that. That's what the Bible says. It, it will do that. We will have a final outcome where the nations will, will be returned, the nations will be reclaimed, we will rule over the nations you know, with the rod of iron, we, we get the morning star, we displace angels, we rule over angels, all that stuff in unseen realm. Okay, all of that is the case. But in Revelation 12, the emphasis is, okay, you got stuff happening on earth, now let's take the heavenly view. People are going to die on earth. It's a terrible time. But let's take the heavenly view. And the heavenly view is that the accuser of the brethren can accuse no more. If you are a member, here, here's, what, here's what all that means. If you are a member of the kingdom of God, you will have eternal life. The one who owned your soul because of the fall, okay, who, who gets to, you know, accuse believers, you know, this, you know, assert his ownership, point out their sin and their estrangement from God. That's over. That's done with. And it, it's a past fact. 
Colossians 1.13. God has delivered us into the kingdom, has delivered, perfect tense, go look it up, has delivered us into the kingdom of his dear son. If we past, you know, the perfect tense, have been delivered into the kingdom of his dear son, that is a past event. The kingdom is here already, but it's not yet here in its fullness. This is basic New Testament theology that is, is summarily ignored by the people who promote the world ending on September 23rd. Again, Revelation, our first point is past. It's, a, it's about the past. It's not about the future. There isn't a whiff, not a whiff of prediction in Revelation 12. Number two, not only do we have that not going for the September 23rd theorists, but there's no other passage in the New Testament that cites or alludes to the signs of Revelation 12 with respect to the second coming or the end of the age. There is no other passage that references it. There's no other mention of a virgin with 12 stars. There's no other mention of the moon at her feet, the sun in her midst. There's no passage that says in any way, hey, reader, hey, you reading the Bible, you might want to study the star of Bethlehem to learn about the second coming. Not the first, but the second coming. You got that? Okay, there's no passage that says that. There is no other reference to birth astronomy anywhere in the New Testament except Matthew 2 and Revelation 12. And Matthew 2 doesn't say, hey, the second time that this guy shows up, you know, that, that, that Revelation 12, that, that's what that's about. There's nothing like that. There's, there's just no textual support for this idea. There's nothing in Scripture that tells us that Revelation 12, which is clearly past, birth of the Messiah, I would suggest that's in the past. Ascension, resurrection, ascension, that's in the past. There, there, there's no other verse outside of Revelation 12 that tells us to read Revelation 12 as a future thing. There just isn't. Again, I, again, I don't write the material. I, I, I can read it and I can study it, and so can you. And you will find that what I'm telling you here is completely correct. Third, the September 23rd phony prophecy cites the astronomical signs associated with end times in the Bible generally. It cites them haphazardly and selectively. In other words, they cheat or they're inept. I mean, you, get, you got one or the other. Both, neither choice is really flattering, but it's one or the other. Now, some say Revelation 12 is the sign of the beginning of the tribulation. But where's the verse? that associates Revelation 12's signs with the beginning of the tribulation or the tribulation period at all. Well, it's a, it's a, it's a persecution stuff, you know, right? Oh, really? So, okay, let me, let me go back to Revelation 12. Got the birth of Messiah, check. Okay, do, do, do we know that that happened? Yep, check. Do we know that was in the past? Check. Okay, so like if that marked the beginning of the, of the seven-year tribulation, then why are we still here? You know, shouldn't like seven years later, the Lord have returned? Revelation 12, verse 6, and, and what follows, is not about the tribulation period. Again, I'm speaking to people who, you know, who, who adopt you know, that, that system. Just, just think about it a little bit. Where's the verse as well that associates any signs in the sky? Now, catch, catch this. Where's the verse that associates any signs in the sky with the beginning of the tribulation at all? Well, there's those, those passages about the, the sun being darkened and the moon being darkened and the blood moons and you know, all that stuff. Well, if you actually read those passages, they come from somewhere. All of those things come from somewhere, and that somewhere would be the Old Testament, that thing that's three quarters of your Bible, the Old Testament. And you know, if you, got, if you go back and look at the Old Testament, you know what they're associated with? the day of the Lord. Now, if you're a standard pre-trib, pre-mill, eschatological person, okay, and, and you, you have like a pre-trib rapture, well, even if you don't have a pre-trib rapture, if, you, if, you're, if you're like, there's a tribulation period of seven years, and then we have the second coming, okay, wherever you put the rapture doesn't matter. If you've if you got the seven-year period, and then you've got the second coming at the end of the seven-year period, well, guess what? All of the signs, the celestial signs, mark the end, because the end of the seven-year tribulation period is when the day of the Lord happens. This is when everything just blows up. This is when you get Armageddon. This is when you get the judgment of the nations. This is when you get the vindication of the righteous, the return of the Lord with, you know, the holy ones, which includes, you know, believers. This is when you get that stuff. The day of the Lord is when 
everything wrong is made right and everything r- that, that was right to begin with is vindicated. Again, just, just a little basic day of the Lord theology. All of it would be at the end of the tribulation, not the beginning. There isn't a single verse that puts these signs at the beginning of the tribulation, or put another way, there's no verse that, that puts these signs seven years prior to the day of the Lord. There just isn't. Again, you could just look the signs up and look at the verses, read the verses. Look in, in your, when you're reading your Bible, look at the little footnotes, little letter one, two, or A, B, or whatever, and they will direct you to cross references in the Old Testament that the New Testament writer is using to write their material. Now, if you search for the term tribulation, and of course I did this in, in preparation for this episode and you know, preparation for you know, other things as well, if you search for the, the tribulation, again, you're going to find that, that this is true. Uh, you can search for sun, you can search for moon, and, and the word dark in conjunction with sun or moon, or blood, moon, or you, know, you, can, you can do all of the searching. Okay, it's all associated with the day of the Lord, or the one exception is going to be Acts chapter 2, or Pentecost. Again, if, if, the, if this is supposed to be the beginning of the tribulation, like, why are we here? Because what, if Pentecost marked the beginning of the tribulation, well, then seven years later, Jesus should have returned, right? Again, everywhere you look, it implodes on itself. It fails miserably. There are celestial signs, again, mentioned in conjunction with end times, eschatology, but they are associated with the day of the Lord. Okay, Matthew 24, 29, just just think, just listen to this. Immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened, the moon will not give its light, and the stars will fall from heaven, and the powers of the heavens will be shaken. Same thing in Mark 13, 24. Same thing in Luke 21, 25. I mean, all you have to do is look up these items. And the language itself is going to to show you where these signs fit. They do not fit, you know, at the beginning of the tribulation. Now, you could say, well, okay, you know, if, if the Lord returns at the end of the tribulation, then, hey, these signs are associated with the, with the second coming because that's in conjunction with the day of the Lord. Well, you'd be correct then. But guess what? None of these things are in Revelation 12. None of them. So why would we use Revelation 12 to interpret these passages in the Gospels so that we could calculate dates? Why would we do that? Well, to be a little cynical, I'll tell you why people do this. They do it to get an audience. They do it to sell things, they do it for ego, or they do it because they're either sinister or just plain inept. That's why they do it. The, the, the greater question, and frankly the more important question, is why do people follow them? Why do so many people buy in to this thinking when they, they either have the books sitting on their lap that they could check it out, or they have software, they have something online? It is not difficult to check these things. We have, we, I, I guess the conclusion I have to draw is we have a lot of people in our churches that either can't think well, have, are, are basically bil- biblically illiterate, or they just don't care. And, and that's really sad. Any one of those options is really sad. This is not rocket science. This is not like, oh, this guy's so smart. I have to listen to him because oh, he, he spent his whole life studying this stuff. Well, actually, you can, you can destroy it in about five minutes with a concordance. You really could. But people won't do it. They're either disinterested or they've been convinced somehow that this is some sort of wizard in front of them or online making this website. They're not. They're not. Uh, and, and, you know, you, you have scripture. You can look at these things up for yourself, and you should. If, if, you, if you have the tools and you're not using them, that's, that's on you. That's on you. Um, you know, it's sad to say, but but that's on you. Number four, the, the the fourth problem, let's just put it this way, the fourth problem with all of this is that it is based as well in part on overreading the, quote, sign of the Son of Man, unquote. People arbitrarily say that Revelation 12 is the sign of the Son of Man. Now let's put our thinking caps on. Let's utilize the powers of our investigative mind to dig into this. As we read through Revelation 12, does the phrase Son of Man ever show up? No. 
Well, if we looked up the phrase son of man everywhere else in the New Testament, does that ever reference anything in Revelation 12, you know, these astronomical signs? No, it doesn't. So that took, again, if you had a concordance, you could, you could do that in a couple minutes. You could destroy the foundation of the idea with very little effort. You know, you, you look at Matthew 24, again, immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be dark and the moon will not give its light. The stars will fall from heaven. The powers of the heavens will be shaken. Then will appear in heaven the sign of the Son of Man, and all the tribes of the earth will mourn, and they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. Again, the tribulation is past. There's the reference to the Son of Man. We get astronomical signs. Yes, the the sun will be darkened. Is that what Revelation 12 says? No. The moon will not give its light. Is that what Revelation 12 says? No. No. Now, you know, we do get an an allusion to the stars will fall from heaven, but no, no. no, See, if you're taking Revelation 12 as astronomy, then you, you you have to literalize that. So does Revelation 12 describe asteroids falling, comets, meteors falling to earth? No, it doesn't. It, it, it describes a war in heaven that involves Satan, which tells you that it's talking about divine beings. It's talking about spiritual stars, spiritual members of the heavens, not astronomical. And again, Revelation 12 doesn't point to anything future anyway. I should add, look, look, at, the, look at the description in verse 30. Then will appear in heaven the sign of the Son of Man. And then all the tribes of the earth will mourn. They will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven. Clouds are not astral signs, folks. They are meteorological. And also they're not re- mentioned in Revelation 12. Now, you know, let, let's just drift back here to the sign of the Son of Man. I mean, you, you, could, you could compare what's being said to these passages you know, for, for a couple of hours and, and, again, poke fun at it. But I'm hoping you, you, you get the message. Just, just think about what's said and go, actually go look at the passages. Back to the sign of the Son of Man. Now, in, uh, this is actually a, a difficulty, you know, in biblical studies and New Testament studies. There are a number of competing interpretations to the Son of Man. I, I, so I, our point here is that people overread a sign of the Son of Man. They assume that it, it talks about what, what's being described here in Revelation 12. The, son of, the sign of the Son of Man is actually never identified at all, and that's why it's a problem. Now, I'm, I'm going to quote a little section here from uh, Lewis's hermeneutic, Hermenea Commentary. I believe this one's on this volume's on Matthew, and he says this about the sign of the Son of Man here in, in his discussion of uh, Matthew 24, 29 and 30. He says there are three competing interpretations. The first corresponds to the interpretive tradition of the ancient church, although today it has the fewest advocates. According to this interpretation, the sign of the Son of Man is a cosmic cross appearing in the sky. The Didache in chapter 16, verse 6, already understood it this way. And the Didache is, is again, a, a part of what we would call the early patristic, early church fathers, you know, set of writings. So it's, it's actually pretty close to the New Testament era. So the Didache, it's kind of a, a Christian, I don't want to say handbook, that's a little too flippant, but sort of a, a, a discipleship manual, a manual for following Jesus, that sort of thing. Again, an early Christian text, the Didache already understood it this way. And that was followed by numerous older and more recent interpreters. But again, as Liz commented, this, is, this one has the fewest advocates today. The second interpretation, continuing with Luz, understands the sign in the Holy War tradition as a field banner or flag, a standard. In support of this interpretation are especially a number of biblical texts in which sign, the Greek is semeon, appears in connection with trumpet, Okay, the Greek word for trum- trumpet is, it's hard to pronounce, salpix or something like that. You have two consonants, the, the G and the S bump into each other, and it makes it difficult. So we've got, in, in, in biblical text, the word sign, semeon, and the word for trumpet are you know, often you know, found together. And when they are, especially in the Old Testament, it refers to sort of a, a military situation where you have a field banner that, that becomes the, the, the particular sign, you know, sort of, you know, to coordinate troop movements or, or a specific, you know, regiment, if you want to use that term, a specific portion of, of a tribe that, that goes out to war, that sort of thing. So what, what he's suggesting here is that we need to judge the sign of the Son of Man along with 
the reference to trumpets. And if you do that, you're going to have the sign of the Son of Man have something to do, perhaps, again, this is, a, this is a guess because it's never actually spelled out. You're going to have the sign of the Son of Man in some way associated with the, you know, the Feast of Trumpets or the, the trumpets that sounded you know, on Tishri 1 or something like that. Now, if you took it that way, again, that's a connection to the Tishri 1 of Revelation 12. But again, Revelation 12 talks about a past event, not a future one. It doesn't give us the details that, that say, this is how you should read this passage. Again, this is a guess. And also, Revelation 12 doesn't refer to the sign of the Son of Man. Why, why wouldn't it refer to the sign of the Son of Man? Because it's past. It's relating a past event, not a future one. That's why the sign of the Son of Man is not mentioned in Revelation 12. Third, third view, going back to Luz, in contrast with these two interpretations is a third, and it's specifically modern, the interpretation that assumes no particular sign in addition to the Son of Man himself. This view would understand the phrase of the Son of Man, okay, after the word sign, sign of the Son of Man, is understood here as an exegetical genitive. In other words, without getting into the grammar speak, the sign is the Son of Man himself. The sign of the Son of Man is the actual appearance of the Son of Man. That, this is the third view. So the only sign promised by Jesus is his appearance itself. That's how you would parse the third option. Now, again, these are, th are three views, and they have you know, competition among scholars. They've all got, you know, they've got, they've got something going for them, except maybe the first one. I think the first one's a little far-fetched. But it was, again, it's part of the early church tradition. You know, if you were living a few decades after the crucifixion, you might think of the cross as the sign of the Son of Man. That's understandable. But again, there's nothing exegetical to hang that on. So the second and third view are, are really the ones that, that sort of get, get discussed by scholars. But Scripture itself is ambiguous. There, there's no clarity on the matter. We might ask ourselves as well, well, in Matthew, you know, he has these astronomical signs. And, you know, Matthew 24, 29, and 30... You know, he, he, he's talking about sun, moon, and stars and losing their brightness and all that kind of stuff. Well, we're, might we want to ask where that comes from? It comes from the Old Testament, as I mentioned before. Now, generally, the day of the Lord gets described in terms of these astronomical phenomena, you know, a, a lot. You got Amos 5.18, 5.20, Amos 8.9 and following, Jeremiah 4.23, Zephaniah 1.15, Ezekiel 32.7, Joel 2.10. You get a number of these references, but specifically, Matthew is referring to two passages, Isaiah 13.10 and Isaiah 34.4. I'm going to read a, a little quotation here from, uh, from Hagner uh, in this regard. This is Hagner's uh, commentary on the, on the same passage. The lines used to describe the changes in the sun, moon, and stars are drawn from the language of the Septuagint, the LXX. Thus, the reference to the sun being darkened and moon not giving its light is taken from apocalyptic material from Isaiah 13.10. The only significant difference is Matthew's cinnamon. He uses phagos, which comes from Joel 2.10 and Joel 4.15, instead of Matthew's phos for the term light. Both of those terms can speak of light. Matthew uses a different one. Back to Hagner. Although Isaiah 13.10 also mentions the stars not giving their light, Matthew next alludes to the Septuagint of Isaiah 34.4. Quote, All the stars will fall like leaves from a vine, and as leaves fall from a fig tree. With this last point, again, notice the fig tree parable in verses 32 and 33. So it's, it's in close proximity here to what Matthew is, uh, is talking about. Only Matthew's phrase, from the sky, is added to these Old Testament passages to complete the sense of his own idea. Only that phrase is not verbally paralleled in these Septuagint passages. The fourth line, which reads, and the powers of heaven will be shaken, finds no direct parallel in the Old Testament, but is similar to the statement in Joel 2.10, the heaven will be shaken, and also Isaiah 34.4 once again, the heaven will be rolled up as a scroll. So conceptually, they're the same, but the wording is not the same. Now, this is, you know, again, me talking here. Did you notice or do you have in your head the context of Isaiah 13? Okay, Matthew, talking about the day of the Lord, 
the return of the sign of the Son of Man, all that stuff, quotes Isaiah 13. Isaiah 13 is an oracle against Babylon. Now, if you've listened to the podcast at any, you know, for any length, you know that Babylon is a big deal. We're not just talking about the city. The, the way that Jews generally and New Testament writers specifically think of Babylon, they're not just thinking it's a bad place because, oh, we, you know, our people spent 70 years in captivity there. That was awful. Okay, that's part of it. But Babylon as a metaphor of chaos and everything that is oppositional to the Most High God and his people goes all the way back into the early chapters of Genesis. You say, well, why bring that up? Well, what I'm suggesting is maybe this talk in Matthew 24, 29, and 30, about all this cosmic stuff going on at the time of the Lord's return, maybe it's not about astronomy at all. Maybe we're supposed to be thinking of spiritual warfare here. Maybe we're supposed to be thinking of Babylon because Babylon is sort of the ground zero metaphor for the hostile forces of darkness that oppose God and his people. Maybe that's what we're supposed to be thinking. Maybe, maybe you know, it's just saying that the Lord's going to return in the context of, of a time of, of just utter spiritual darkness. Maybe that's the point. Maybe it doesn't have anything to do at all with physical astronomy. We're going to get to one more point after this that I think sort of strengthens that idea. If you go to Isaiah 34, the other passage that he quotes, who's in the crosshairs in Isaiah 34, 4? Okay, you've got the, the, na- you know, the, the nations on the earth and the powers in heaven. You, you, again, Deuteronomy 32 worldview, the nations are under the dominion of, of you know, powers of darkness, you know, fallen gods. But you read a few verses down after the quotation, who's mentioned? Edom. Edom, again, is another way of—, of you, you couldn't think of Edom without thinking of Babylon. In the Old Testament period, we, we covered the book of Obadiah here on the podcast. If you want to know why I'm saying that Edom has a close association with Babylon, go listen to those, those couple episodes, two episodes on Obadiah. You can't think of Edom without thinking about Babylon. One just sort of became a metaphor for the other. And it's because of the circumstances of what happened when Babylon you know, destroyed Jerusalem. Edom, Edom helped. Okay, so again, it's another way of referring to this sort of, again, this matrix of ideas, this complex of ideas. But our last point here, our fifth problem, you know, why, why didn't, you know, why doesn't Revelation 12 signal the end of the world on September 23rd? Well, the, generally, the people who, who prop up this kind of idea fail to note that the falling stars language, and this is for the Wormwood crowd too, this is for the Revelation 8, you know, Wormwood crowd. There's a, there's a consistent failure to note that falling stars language, the, the flaming falling mountains from the sky, you know, coming to earth, that language refers to divine beings in Jewish literature, especially in the second temple period. I mean, it can refer to that in the Old Testament here and there as well, but especially the second temple period. So in other words, this language may have absolutely nothing at all to do with physical astronomy, comet, meteor, whatever, asteroid, may have nothing at all to do with it. Now, you could go read my, my blog post on Wormwood, but I'm going to quote a little bit from Beale's commentary, which I quote there on Revelation 8, 10 to 11, and this will be where we wrap up. Now, just, just, just listen. This is from Beale's commentary, his Revelation commentary on, on Revelation 8, 10, and 11. He says, As with the second trumpet, so again here, a great fireball is thrown from heaven. This time it is not depicted as a, quote, great mountain, but as a, quote, great star burning like a torch, unquote. If this is a continuation of the similar judgment of the first two trumpets, then the fire can again be understood as a metaphor. We have observed elsewhere that stars represent angelic beings. Here's the main point. Stars represent angelic beings in the book of Revelation, in the Old Testament, and again in post-biblical Judaism post-biblical meaning after the Old Testament here. These angels themselves often corporately represent earthly peoples and kingdoms, and fire typically symbolizes judgment in the apocalypse and other related literature. The same must be the case here. Again, the angels that have control over the nations, again, the fall of the fallen sons of God might really be what's in view here. This interpretation, Beale says, is supported by 1 Enoch 18.13. Just read you that. 
It says, there I saw seven stars like great burning mountains. Okay. The seven stars in 1st Enoch 18 are going to be identified as watchers, fallen watchers. 1st Enoch 21.3, there I beheld seven of the stars of heaven bound and thrown into the abyss like, a, like great mountains burning with fire. 1st Enoch 21 is again about how the watchers were bound, the sinning watchers of Genesis 6, the whole you know, watcher story. They're referred to in similar language. Again, these stars of heaven like great mountains burning with fire. They're thrown into the abyss. It's the language of Revelation 8. It has nothing to do with Nibiru or Planet X. And again, if you want the astronomy for why that's nonsense, go back to Stuart's you know, podcast, you know, and, and, and he'll, he'll give you all the science you can handle there. Again, just, just to wrap up and with Beale here, this kind of language for the stars falling, and even, even to the point where they're, they're described as flaming mountains, okay, fiery stars, you know, falling to the earth. That is stock description, stock language in Jewish apocalyptic literature, Book of Revelation and Second Temple material. It's a stock description for fallen sons of God, fallen divine beings. It has nothing to do with astronomy at all. So you've got five problems if you're trying to marry Revelation 12 to this stuff, you're doing it arbitrarily. You're doing it without scriptural justification. And you might even be missing the entire point. The entire point might just be spiritual warfare okay, associated with the second coming. I mean, the dragon was angry enough at the first coming, and he knows his time is short, you know, all that kind of stuff you know, that we read. Again, it might just be about spiritual warfare. It might have nothing to do with astronomy at all. But it's just one of the ambiguities that are actually present in the text. And when the text is ambiguous, you need to let it be ambiguous. You need to let it be what it is. You don't need to start filling in the gaps with your imagination or your ego. And that's what's happening. That's what's happening with all these date setting prophets. And then, you know, they want to back away and tell you how they didn't say this or that, or, oh, this was fulfilled in a different way than I thought. And they'll keep people following them. Okay, what they deserve is rebuke and your inattention. They deserve to be ignored. And so I hope this will be yet another lesson in why these people should just not have an audience at all. Yeah, Mike. And the reason why they do have an audience, in my opinion only, is that people just don't take the time to figure out what's going on. People and Christians, they, they, they hear something sensational, like the world's going to end and they don't yep. really understand the reasoning behind it. So then they go buy the book. So they watch the show or they do whatever and they listen to it because they think, Oh, you know, I don't know what's really the Bible really says about anything. So I'm going to pay attention to it. To see if there's any validity to it. I mean, I'm not going to complain that the world's going to end tomorrow, but mm -hmm. I think a lot of these people, they just don't know. They're just ignorant. They don't know what the Bible really says about anything because people don't read the Bible today. And so they're going to listen to the first person that comes up with some sensational answer. Yeah. And even in the unbelieving community, they're going to, they're going to be lots, there's you know, probably hundreds of thousands, maybe millions of people who read that Huffington Post piece that aren't, aren't believers at all, have no interest in the Bible. And they're not going to go look. They're not going to fact check that. No. No. It's it's, that's, that's going to become what the Bible is for them. It's entertainment. Yep. It's fun. It's these yep. weirdos over here. It's uh, and, and for instance, like that guy that that uh, is getting the most attention about this, they're calling him a Christian numerologist, which doesn't yep. even exist. What is that? And uh, <laughs> yeah, thanks for that. <laughs> just making us look foolish. Yep. It's sad. Uh, it is sad. But there you go. Hopefully, people come to listen to this show and get some answers. Uh, Mike, next week, we're going to have a, another special guest. Yep. Yep. Uh, I'm looking forward to this. We're going to have Holly Pivik. I believe I'm pronouncing her name correctly on, she has the blog spirit of air and her, she's, she's a co-author, um, of a book on the new apostolic reformation. So this is something that I, I, ha I had to read her book to become familiar with it because a, I don't pay attention to popular Christian movements at all. And I'm really divorced from anything that would sort of touch the the, the charismatic uh, movement. I mean, those of you who have come to events, you know, and have heard, you know, some interactions on some other things know that I'm not, I'm not hostile, you know, to, to people who are 
practicing the gifts and say the gifts are still for today. Again, it has to have a scriptural grounding and a context for it. But that's about as close as I get, you know, to that world uh, of, of Christianity. And there, there's a lot of abuse that goes on on in there. There's a lot of nonsense there as well. And so I wanted to have Holly on so that she can talk specifically about this thing called the New Apostolic Reformation and sort of, you know, hopefully learn from her, like, what does that term mean in relationship to other terms? And, and how do we, how do we kind of navigate that, that part of Christianity? How do we separate sort of the, 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 you know, the, the people who are being thoughtful and really want to tether their theology to the text and the people who want to tether their theology to emotion and, and sort of, you know, authority and, and lord it over people and, and just do things like this. So those of you who are listening out there, I, I'm sure you've you've had you know, maybe some good experience, you know, with that part of the of the believing church and you've had some negative experiences. Like we've had Fern and Audrey on a few times and they've had some really bad experiences in the deliverance movement. And again, that's going to be part of this sort of kind of discussion. But I wanted to have Holly on because again, she has you know co-authored this book and I think it's an an important resource and we need to all uh, be able to learn a little something about this from her because she spends this is this is her thing. She spends a lot of time uh, reading about these people, their own material, and talking about uh, what what this this NAR thing, the New Apostolic Reformation, really is. So uh, I, th- I think it'll be a good episode. Okay, well, Mike, just in case this is our last show, it's been fun, and uh, <laughs> I and, and I I won the league. <laughs> <laughs> Well, the, the, I, the pugs pulled it out just in the nick of time. <laughs> a little asterisk with it because it's not a full right. season. So, um, but anyway, yeah. um, please go leave us a review wherever you consume our podcast for the people who are left behind, so they can uh, <laughs> get caught up. And um, but uh, all right, Mike. Well, with that, um, we appreciate you setting the record straight and uh, letting us know while we're still here on the twenty fourth and. Uh, I just want to thank everybody else for listening to the Naked Bible Podcast. God bless. Thanks for listening to the Naked Bible Podcast. To support this podcast, visit www.nakedbibleblog.com. To learn more about Dr. Heiser's other websites and blogs, go to www.drmsh.com.